Welcome everyone. Uh, this is the session, Transparent Innovation, Pioneering Vendor Agnostic Data Acquisition. So I'm the moderator. Uh, my name is Dan Ma, Assistant Professor in Bi Biomedic Engineering uh, Department at Case Western Reserve University. Today, uh, we're very excited to have four speakers um, to talk about um, yeah, vendor agnostic uh, data acquisition. Um, so um, our speakers include Dr. Nicolas Stikov from University of Montreal, um, Dr. Andrea Gasper from University of Lisbon, um, Dr. John Tamir from University of Texas, and Dr. Hi Tobias Glock and uh, Newell, Newell Allen from uh, univers uh, uh, New York University. Um, so yeah, uh, we can get started. Uh, if you uh, have any questions, please put your question in the Q&A session. Um, we'll have some time to discuss the question and answer your questions. So um, our first speaker, Dr. Nikola Stikov. Um, I, can, I can read your um, bio. Dr. Uh, Nikola Stikov is an associate professor of biomedical engineering, a researcher at the Montreal Heart Institute and co-director of NeuroPoly the Neuroimaging Research Laboratory at at Cole, sorry, Polytechnique. Polytechnique. <laughs> Polytechnic University of Montreal. Um, I, I really want to point out that he's the vocal open science advocate, leading the open science access of Cubic Bioimaging Network, um, and sitting on the steering committee of the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform. He's also the co-founder of Neural. Libro.org, uh, okay, yeah. a, a preprint server for hosting executable research objects, and the founder of the Center of Advanced Interdisciplinary Research at the University of the Cyril. Sorry. <laughs> I can say it. I can repeat that. Cyril and Methodius. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, please welcome our first speaker. Uh, the title is a vendor neutral approach to MRI. Wonderful. So thank you for the introduction. And I'll, I'll try to make sense of all of these unusual names in different languages. So uh, I am a professor at Ecole Polytechnique at the University of Montreal. Uh, and then I also have an appointment at uh, the University in Macedonia, where I'm currently at. So this is uh, the University St. Cyril and Methodius. And uh, we started a center for interdisciplinary research uh, uh, about a year ago. Uh, so uh, uh, first, thank you for the invitation. It's good to be back at MRI together. And uh, last year, I spoke more about NeuroLibre and our publishing initiative. This time, I'm going to talk about vendor neutral uh, MRI. Uh, but I feel that these two intersect in different ways. And uh, a couple of different people from my lab are also speakers at MRI together. So you hear about these things from different angles. Um, Matthew Boudreau will present about MRM highlights and what we're doing to promote reproducibility in the MRM community. And then uh, uh, Aga Karakuzu will talk more about uh, the NeuroLibre project because it's really gaining steam and I think it's it's turning into something very ambitious. Uh, so that being said, let me just uh, share my screen and start the presentation. Uh, and uh, I hope you can all see it. Is this... Uh... Yes, this is everybody. Dan, it's all good. Yeah, it, perfect. Yeah, we can see it. Excellent. So I'll start by mentioning highlights because I think it motivates a lot of the work that I've been doing in the eight years since we started it. Uh, I imagine many of you are familiar with it. Uh, we publish uh, interviews with researchers in the field, uh, and then we throw a wild party uh, somewhere uh, around the world. Uh, we have done a party at a bar in Singapore, on the beach in Hawaii, um, on a boat in Paris. Uh, in a guard gallery in Montreal, in a former Masonic temple uh, in uh, Toronto. And uh, now we need to do something even more interesting in Singapore. So uh, stay tuned. There will be something. But uh, the nice thing is that ever since I stepped down from uh, the editorial board of MRM, Highlights took a turn towards uh, produce, promoting uh, reproducible research. And uh, this is under the guidance of Mathieu Boudreau, who is uh, maintaining the web uh, uh, portal for highlights, and Maria Eugenia Caliguri, who is currently the, uh, uh, I think she's the current or maybe the incoming chair of the Reproducible Research Study Group. And the interviews that we do for MRM highlights are all about papers that promote reproducibility. 
Uh, and uh, I see some of the people on this call that have actually been interviewed for uh, highlights. And uh, also, Matthew started this thing that he calls Reproducible Research Insights, hashtag RR Insights, on the site formerly known as Twitter. And uh, turns out that we have interviewed 31 uh, different or authors of 31 different articles that share reproducible research insights. And then just for a review article that I'm writing uh, just now, we decided to uh, train a GPT. Basically, we took these interviews and uh, this was the idea of Aga Karakuzu, who I think is on the call. Uh, and basically, we fed them into uh, chat GPT. And we said, OK, now that you have all these interviews, we want you to identify themes, to identify different aspects of reproducibility that you think are important. And we actually use this to create a scoping review, kind of like a special kind of review article for reproducibility and MRI methods. And uh, I will just share a couple of pictures from here. One is this. We actually grouped uh, a lot of these articles by the keywords and created something called uh, uh, word maps. Uh, these are word embeddings from Semantic Scholar. And we ask Semantic Scholar to group these articles in different clusters. And what you see here, this is completely automatic. We haven't done any kind of movement. All of these weights and graphs and edges are actually given from Semantic Scholar. And you will notice that there is this uh, grouping of reproducibility articles related to MRI systems. And those are very distinct from articles about brain connectivity and data and workflows. Each of these articles are related to reproducibility and MRI. But what's really cool is that we have a MRM highlights interview for pretty much every article in this cluster, except for this one right here that is light rose that actually went to nature uh, methods, I believe. And uh, everything else went to MRM. So I feel that we are a community that really kind of, you know, uh, promotes and maybe the only community that promotes reproducibility of MRI technology. So uh, I took this GPT and uh, asked it a couple of questions. And if you want to try it, uh, I'm actually sharing the link over here. I know that not all of you have a subscription to uh, the pro version of chat uh, GPT, but if you want to ask a question in the chat, Aga will take that question, feed it into the GPT and then give you a response. Uh, and the question that I will start with is basically ask, answer this question with a punchy list of bullet points, each referring a specific research article. Why is vendor neutrality important? And then this is what our NeuroRepro Insight GPT responded. Uh, it said, uh, vendor neutrality is crucial in MRI research, as highlighted by specific articles from the provided summaries. Quantitative MRI with vendor neutral sequences, you'll hear quite a lot about that. MRI sequence programming with Gamma Star, I'll mention it briefly. And then some applications for myelin water fractions, for hypopolarized gas MRI, for diffusion MRI and deep neural networks, and for calibrations, basically calibrationless imaging. And GPT says each of these studies underscores different aspects of why vendor neutrality is key in MRI research, from enhancing consistency and reproducibility to enabling innovative, collaborative, and standardized approaches in neuroimaging. So you will realize that this is not your boilerplate chat GPT answer. It actually has context. It has these interviews that we fed it. And I think it does a very good job of uh, grouping and identifying themes. And today, the theme that I want to focus on is vendor neutrality. But uh, let's use this GPT, maybe both in the talks of Aga and Matthew, and even in the Q&A today. I'm curious what you're going to come up with. Uh, and let's see how it answers or maybe how it hallucinates. Uh, now, I think each of these that the chat GPT uh, uh, LLM identified really try to treat the MRI scanner as a measurement device. Unfortunately, the MRI scanner is not a measurement device. And that's not just me saying it, it's also the vendor saying it. So if you take a look at the product manual of the Siemens Magnetome, it will say that the Magnetome is not a measurement device as defined by the medical product guidelines. Measured values obtained are for informational purposes and cannot be used only as the basis for diagnosis. So here we are trying to say, well, you know, we want to make sure that the MRI scanner runs the same way across different vendors. But then the vendors say, no, don't do that. You know, we'll just give you our numbers. And this was motivating enough that I actually gave a talk at the ISMRM a couple of years ago. Uh, it was an educational talk about MRI relaxometry. And we basically, you know, brainstorm with Aga as it often happens. We try to kind of come up with an interesting angle, just like you saw this GPT angle. And back then it said, you know, there's a hype cycle at play here. Relaxometry started out as the most promising MRI application. The way that Demadian originally designed his MRI scanner uh, looked like relaxometry is going to win, and this is going to be the way that we're going to be using MRI. 
But in the end, that's not how it worked out. And if you want to read a little bit more about the history of this, here's a link to uh, a Substack that uh, I contribute to. And uh, basically, you're going to read the story of uh, quantitative MRI and all the different ways in which uh, uh, relaxometry has been helped and hurt by recent innovation in MRI. Uh, there is a figure there, which is interactive. So you can go to this link and you can explore which papers kind of uh, you know created the hype and which papers really dampened this curve. And we argue that basically we've gone through this kind of slope of enlightenment where slowly we're getting out of a trough of disillusionment, figuring out the right way to do quantitative MRI and eventually reaching a field that is mature. So we wrote this and then a company said, we would like to use this blog post for uh, a grant that we're applying for. Can we cite it? And we said, yeah, sure, you can cite it. And then we realized that, you know, this probably would be more citable if it was a uh, article. Uh, and then we said, you know, should we just submit this somewhere? And Aga said, yes, let's submit, but we'll only publish it if they accept it verbatim, word for word, no changes whatsoever. And it turns out that there was this uh, collection, a research topic in Frontiers. We submitted it there sometime in, I don't know, July, August. And then we responded. We got a review that was actually very constructive. Uh, it's signed you know, by a scientist who has their opinion about what we wrote. But in the end, the scientist said, but you know, everybody has a different angle and I would be happy for this to be published. And then Aga and I looked at each other and we're like, wow, they actually took it. They took it without any edits. They didn't change a comma. It's exactly the same thing. And I don't know how to feel about this. On one hand, we did give them a couple of thousand dollars to do this. On the other, they let us tell our vision and our story exactly the way we wanted to do it. And I think it's a double-edged sword, but yes, now there is an article that you can cite. It's in Frontiers. And uh, it's my first uh, article that I have published in uh, Physiology Journal. It came out in Frontiers Physiology. So make of it what you will. I think many of you know my attitude towards scientific publishing. I think this both exposes how scientific publishing will just publish anything as long as you pay them. But it also says, well, but then, you know, they will actually let you publish what you truly believe. And I think there's some value there. And uh, I would be happy to hear your opinions uh, later on. Now, the question is, and the main question that we ask in this uh, editorial piece is, can we turn MRI into a measurement device? Well, quantitative MRI is one way to do it. Rather than treat uh, MRIs as these alphabet soup of contrast mechanisms, proton density T1, T2, and then you take a spoonful and you get a T1-weighted image, maybe we can treat it as a collection of uh, contrast mechanisms that are nicely compartmentalized into bento boxes. And then you take a look at the, for example, T1 compartment right here, and you generate a T1 map that is also digital, but then every point in this map has units, and it should be exactly the same number across different sites, across different scanners, and hopefully that turns MRI into something that is truly reproducible. And then for one of these past MRI conferences where uh, we were presenting things virtually, I created a video, and uh, I will show you that video as kind of motivation for why I think vendor neutrality is really important. Well, this is the story that I like to tell to convince people that uh, quantitative MRI is useful, but I do have some confessions to make. In reality, that beautiful bento box that you saw, well, it's actually a black box. And uh, looking at such a black box, it's not very easy. Now, if only vendors would join forces on a common platform to help us peek inside the black bento box. The compartments are still there, but it's going to be difficult to see them. And hopefully, we can develop some techniques that will get us to agree. Unfortunately, such a platform doesn't exist. And as far as the vendors are concerned, that was just a green screen, and we are left in the dark. Well, and I still believe this. I feel that vendors are doing very little to open up these black boxes to us. But as I will argue, a lot of MRI does not make sense unless we can keep peek inside those black boxes. So what I will do in the next 10 minutes is just show you one case study, show you one place where I really think vendor neutrality will make a difference. And I will motivate it by an article on T1 mapping that basically exposed the problems that we have in the field. This article was published in 2015. It was one of the most cited papers for the year after being rejected by the ISMRM as an abstract. And basically what it showed is 
If you do T1 mapping, we're using three different techniques in seven different studies and three Tesla in white matter, you will see T1 values that go all the way from 690 to 1100 milliseconds. And some might say, well, yes, but that's, you know, all kinds of different articles, all, all kinds of different methods. Of course, there's going to be a difference. But then we actually repeated the same thing, three different T1 mapping techniques in the same scanner on 10 subjects, and we still saw these differences. Uh, so you will see variations on the order of about 30% in the same subject, in the same session, depending on, on which T1 mapping technique uh, scientist uh, uses. And we're not the only ones to observe this. Uh, since then, there have been quite a few papers that talk about the reproducibility uh, of T1 uh, at different uh, vendors. This is work from the University of Zurich, uh, Eugene Lee and Zoltan Nagy as the last author. And they observed that on average, T1 relaxation times were 8 to 10% higher when calculated from data acquired on the Philips scanner compared to that from the Siemens scanner. And then there is this work that actually says, well, things are not that bad. It's actually under 5%. But what you need to make sure is you're running the same versions. So mean interscanner model deviations were not exceeding 5.21%, provided that identical acquisition sequences are used, discrepancies between QMRI data acquired with different scanner models are low. So if you control the acquisition sequences, you can hope for better reproducibility. And then there's scanner upgrades. This is something that happens all the time, and you're probably not aware of it. But every time a vendor upgrades their system, there are changes that are on the order of 5 to 30%, as mentioned in this work from the NIST, from the National Institute for Standards and Technology. And this is even with the inversion recovery gold standard. The T1 IR results had a dramatic increase in error distribution, post-upgrade plus minus 20%. And then, you know, signal saturation was an issue. Once it was accounted for, T1 errors decreased to plus minus 10% post-upgrade. So aware of all these issues, we said, you know what, let's just do a reproducibility challenge. Let's just say we're going to give you a paper. We're going to give you the code that comes with a paper. And then people are going to acquire T1 maps in phantoms and in vivo on human brains. So this challenge was led by Mathieu Boudreau in my lab. And uh, that's the same Mathieu that's running uh, MRM highlights. And uh, you can see the description of the challenge in the link at the bottom. And uh, what we decided to do is replicate a paper that was published in 2010 that is a robust methodology for in vivo T1 mapping. So it's really kind of explaining how to do T1 mapping in the brain using a gold standard approach. Uh, this is work by Joel Baral uh, from uh, my old lab at Stanford, MRSRL, with Dwight Nishimura as the last author. And then we told the participants, read the paper, read the documentation, and just give us your T1 maps. Fortunately, we got a lot of responses, even though it was right before the pandemic and the pandemic made it difficult to acquire all of this data. But we did end up with 19 different submissions that contained 41 phantom data sets and 56 human data sets. Most of them are three Tesla, except for one, and using three vendors, G, Philips, and Siemens. And then we took all of this and we put it up on Neurolibre. So for those that are not aware of Neurolibre, I would like to do a quick demo. But if you want to see more, I encourage you to see Aga's presentation, which is, I believe, tomorrow. Uh, and it is about what we're trying to do with academic publishing. So let us just show you this. If you go to neurolibre.org, what you will notice is a couple of different preprints. Neurolibre is a preprint server. Any journal can use it. So we have already published uh, preprints with eLife, with Elsevier, with Wiley, MRM, PLOS Computational Biology, and uh, Aperture recently. This is the OHVM journal. And then here are the results of this uh, challenge where you see that everything looks like a standard PDF. Sure, you know, that's something that all of the publishers do and they will take $2,000 from you just to uh, publish it. But then we say this PDF is intended for content registration purposes only. For full access and interactive reading, please visit the reproducible preprint. And the reproducible preprint is right here together with all of the things when this reproducible preprint, including the technical screening, the repository archive, the data archive, uh, the GitHub code. And then if you click here, what will happen is it will just take you to the uh, interactive version of the publication. And you saw that that loaded pretty quickly. And keep in mind that this is from a standard connection in Macedonia, whereas our servers are in Montreal. And it reads like a normal article. 
Except then you will notice that actually some of these figures are interactive. Here's the code that used to generate them. And then you can explore the data. You can show the code that generated the data. You can load the data yourself. You can remix it if you want. Uh, you can change the weightings in your T1 maps, for example, right here. You can just uh, you know change the weightings for the T1. And there is this dashboard that lets you explore, for example, uh, all of the different Phantom and Drain acquisitions, all of the different vendors, Philips, GE, and Siemens. And if you click on the Phantom, what will open up is just this interactive post where you can take a look at the different uh, spheres. And then you can explore how these spheres have changed across sites. Each of these is a different site measurement. And then you can remove G and you can remove Philips. And then you can, for example, focus only on the results from the Siemens scanner. Uh, on top of it, what you can do is you can also run this as a binder instance that is ours. We own it. And Do that. Now, once we have that, we actually submitted it to MRM, and uh, the reviews are in. Uh, the article is most likely going to be accepted. Uh, we were advised to emphasize this kind of aspect of what happens when you have certain sites that control for the acquisition and certain sites that are just given a PDF. And basically, I put this up again on my Substack, uh, crowdsourcing the research article of the future. Uh, it's the only article I will publish this year that is a research article. And if you want to read more about what's in it, I encourage you to go and visit uh, this link over here. And feel free to subscribe to my Substack if you want to see more posts about uh, MRI and reproducibility in academic publishing. But that's the dashboard. These are the results. And then the conclusion is a PDF is not enough. If you only give people a protocol, they will try to implement it, but it will be very site dependent. The only time the results are more close to each other is when you actually have a better description of the pulse sequences and then the environment in which the processing happens. So we need to peek inside the black boxes that generate the numbers. And this is what uh, our lab is trying to do. Uh, and I will show you our approach. But then also, I would like to uh, highlight a couple of other approaches that I think would be interesting for uh, people in this audience. We have developed the software. It's called QMR Lab. Our vision is quantitative MRI under one umbrella. This is the website and uh, uh, also uh, published as a uh, open source uh, uh, software article in the Journal of Open Source Software. Aga Karakuzu is the lead on this. He's really done wonders uh, with the whole QMR Lab environment, including a collab collaboration with a company called Hard Vista. This is a Stanford University startup. Uh, John Pauly is my old PhD supervisor. He's on the board. Juan and Bill did their PhDs right before I did. Bob, who is a cardiologist, because this company primarily works with cardiac MRI. We installed Heart Vista on the 3T Siemens Skyra at the Montreal Heart Institute. Uh, and basically, what Heart Vista does is it bypasses anything that's proprietary from Siemens. And then we deploy RT Hawk, which is uh, uh, just software that is able to deploy any kind of pulse sequence that is on GitHub and run it using the Siemens hardware. And then we run QMR Lab to process all of the data and generate some uh, quantitative MRI maps. This work has gotten a lot of attention. It's won quite a lot of prices. Uh, and uh, it came out as a ar research article in 2022 in MRM. Uh, and uh, you can explore it as an interactive publication using the link below. Uh, the code is on GitHub. It's, in, it's designed in Spinbench, which is uh, free software. We tested it on three different sites, uh, 1G, two Siemens. And what we did is basically we ran a native quantitative MRI routine on GE and Siemens, and then we ran a vendor neutral quantitative MRI routine on those same scanners. And then we showed that using the vendor neutral implementation right here in orange, red, and yellow, the results are much closer to the gold standard uh, phantom values that are given by the company that manufactures them. Whereas if you take a look at the Siemens and the GE implementations in blue and teal, those tend to overestimate the T1 values, uh, some quite significantly. And then when you take a look at the in vivo measurements, you will also see that with the native implementations, G over here is very different from Siemens. And this holds for T1 maps and also two other quantitative MRI maps, magnetization transfer ratio and empty SAT. But then when you run it using our vendor neutral approach, the maps visually look much closer. And this is because the same sequence, the identical sequence was deployed on all scanners. 
And then if you want to take a look at the numbers, for example, the coefficient of variance, you will notice that for the native versus Venus, the variability is much smaller. So the coefficient of variance for the T1 maps, the MTR maps, the empty set maps drops by somewhere between 50 to 60 percent. And this holds across subjects. And uh, we think that it's a result that it has been already replicated by colleagues uh, in uh, Burke and Bilgic's lab who have done something very similar using the pulse seek environment. So we believe that this is solid. There's proof that vendor neutrality reduces variations in uh, quantitative MRI. Uh, our vision is to connect all of these different tools. So we have the QMR pulse seek, which is the pulse sequence environment. The QMR flow, which is uh, basically the orchestration, the processing of all of the data. And then we create these interactive tutorials that make it easy to publish our results. And our goal is to do it obeying the BIDS uh, standard for uh, brain imaging data structures and the ISMRM raw data standard for the case space data. And basically do quantitative MRI with one line of code, QMR fit BIDS. But this is not the only vision. Uh, I think that there's many other possibilities. We have provided something that is very streamlined, state-of-the-art, but it's not free in the sense that the only sites that can actually run our Venus, our vendor-neutral workflows, are the sites that have this RT Hawk system that is FDA-approved, but it is also sold for a significant amount of money. So if we were to democratize these vendor-neutral approaches, we should probably partner up with other uh, 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 projects, with other researchers, who are trying to do this from within the vendor system, but still making it possible to deploy a vendor neutral implementation of a protocol. Uh, the leaders in this and probably the oldest uh, proposal comes from uh, the Freiburg group. Uh, Maxim Zaitsev is the uh, senior author here. And there is the PulseSeq uh, environment, which uh, used to work only on Siemens and GE. They just managed to do a PulseSeq implementation on uh, Philips. And I'm about to go on a sabbatical in Japan at Juntedo University to work on a pulse uh, implementation uh, for Canon. So we hope that four vendors will be um, incorporated. And then hopefully that creates this community of people that care about vendor neutrality, each of them trying to do it differently, but recognizing that this is important. There was an ISMRM virtual meeting that happened just a couple of weeks ago from November 15th to 17th. And if you want to look at all of the presentations and all of the different people that use pulse some using Hearty Hawk and uh, uh, Hard Vista, some using uh, the uh, Siemens and G ecosystems for developing vendor neutral sequences. All the presentations are the GitHub link here. There is also the Gamma Star platform. This comes from Matthias Gunter and his team. Uh, and this is also an exciting development, especially because they have been a uh, tri vendor from the very beginning uh, Siemens, G, and uh, Philips. And what we have done recently is try to develop a vendor neutral implementation of one T1 mapping protocol called MP2 Rage, which started out in the public domain, was converted into a product sequence by Siemens, and currently all of the MP2 Rage, MP2 Rage acquisitions that happen in the world, I would say 95% are done on Siemens. And what we would like to do is we would like to create an MR Bazaar, kind of like a app store where different people will put different implementations and then other sites can use them and reuse them in exactly the same way. This is inspired by a book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. It talks about the development of the Linux ecosystem. Uh, it has this very famous quote, which is Linus's law, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. It explains how for-profit companies have used this cathedral, uh, sorry, this bazaar model, because basically if you build as a cathedral, it's very different to, uh, very difficult to innovate. But if you let other people bring a bazaar to you, then it's very easy to deploy new techniques. MATLAB is a leader in this. MATLAB is cited in this essay. And they're doing it in a very smart way where they have a proprietary language, but then they have a lot of toolboxes that are developed by the community and eventually incorporated into MATLAB. And we want to create the first MRI bazaar. And our vision is we want to make Venus our project, Gamma Star, the Matthias Gunter project, and PulseSeq, the Maxim Zaitsev project, work together to implement MP2 Rage. So then every person that uses a vendor neutral protocol will make sure that the three of us have standardized and we are endorsing MP2 Rage as a proper vendor neutral way of doing T1 mapping. And you know that makes it a little bit more shareable, it makes it more reproducible, and hopefully it makes these projects really kind of create a community around them. 
And we wanted to call this project MR Bazaar, but then uh, a couple of people said it just sounds too uh, Eastern. Uh, and Aga and I laughed because we're both from that part of the world. Like for us, Bazaar is a nice thing, but then we wanted to give it kind of like a more sophisticated feel. So we called it MRI FAIR. And uh, FAIR also stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible and reusable. So uh, stay tuned because this MRI FAIR idea actually was uh, the runner up in the Shark Tank contest at the ISMRM last year. And we really want to make it happen. And for that purpose, I will actually spend a couple of months uh, next year on a sabbatical, uh, spending time at NYU Abu Dhabi, uh, working with a Cleveland clinic, spending time at Juntendo University in Tokyo, and working with uh, the hospital over there so that we can deploy some vendor neutral implementations that could be clinically useful. Uh, community building is very important. So there's the hackathon that we organized in Montreal in 2019, another hackathon we organized in Toronto in 2023 after the pandemic. You'll see lots of familiar faces here. And then I want you to mark your calendars because we will do a hackathon in Singapore on May 3rd, 2024, right before the ISMRM. That's the Friday before the ISMRM. And I want to thank uh, all of my collaborators, uh, my colleagues, and you for the attention. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if you would like to work with us. I think that's 30 minutes exactly. And uh, I hope to uh, join you in a discussion afterwards. So uh, thank you for your attention.